Because the scripture says, I will never do what? I will never leave you nor what? Forsake you. We'll be looking at um, uh, finishing up Psalm 27 this morning. And we're looking at Psalm 27, verses 7 through 14. Follow me as we as we read verses 7 through 14. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desire of my adversaries. The false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Amen. Encouraging words. Um, as we, it seems like, that if we're in a desperate enough situation, that's when we reach out to God. It's not, maybe not before, because maybe we think God's too busy, or maybe because God's not interested enough in our need. Um, but it seems like when we get to a place where we're in utter desperation, or we feel like there's no other recourse, that's when we really reach out to God. Sometimes we do that. I know that in my, as, I, as I was in my early part of my faith, while I was backsliding, and I was, really, I was really following, I was really walking far from the Lord. I had come to the Lord at a younger age, when I, at my early teens, and then I walked away. And, and then I started coming back when I got into college. But it wasn't until I was desperate enough of my situation, how my situation was really dire at the time, and I was getting into stuff, dangerous stuff, get dangerous things, and I wasn't really, prior to that point, I wasn't really desperate enough to seek God. I said, oh, I can continue, I can do this, I can do that. But it was only until I really got to a place where my circumstances got really challenging and really difficult that I said, God, I really need you, and God, I need you, and I, God, I need you. And I was persistent, and I didn't give up in my, in, my, in my plea in seeking God. And it took a long time because God wanted me to persevere in, in my time, in my prayer, in my seeking Him. Because if I didn't, I wouldn't be here now. Think about us when we're desperate. Are we desperate enough when we're in a situation, we're in dire straits and our circumstances are really challenging? Are we really seeking God and not giving up even though we don't see the answer coming right away? Well, this morning we're going to be looking at David and how he, we looked at it last week. He was dealing with fear. He was dealing about his own son coming after him. And, 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 and what we and what we were what he was going to do desperate david was desperate enough to seek god and say god i'm i'm afraid my enemies are around me but my only hope my only way i can look to is you and so today we're going to look at how De david even came to a place of desperation god god i need you and that's what we're going to look at and we're going to see how david found hope in the Lord. But let, we're going to look at three specific points. It says, Hear, O Lord, our plea, and then our hope and our instruction. Our first point, our hope and our instruction, verses 13 and 14. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me, and answer me. When we we know if we've been walking with the Lord any length of time in our lives, that we've developed a relationship with the Lord, that we, we know him to a certain degree, a certain level, because we've, we've been walking with him, and we've had a relationship with him. And so when we, we've learned 
that as in our own personal experience and from instruction that if we want God's attention, we have to do what? We have to ask for it. Sometimes when my sons are not getting enough attention, they'll start acting out. And they'll start doing things so that we can, I can get their attention. Sometimes they, they do it for the wrong reason. They do it, they do wrong things for the right reasons. If you understand, if you understand what I mean by that. But our, what we do is that we come to a place where we're, we want God's attention, and what do we do in order to get God's attention? Because we know that we look at our situation, we look at our circumstances, we're surrounded by enemies, There's, our circumstances are really difficult, they're really fearful, they're really challenging, they're really all the above. And we say, God, hear me. So in other words, you're crying out of what? A heart of what? desperation. You really need for God to hear you, don't you? Does God hear you? Does God? God, of course God hears you. But we have to come to a place where we really know in our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, that God is hearing us. And so what do we do? God, hear me. God, hear me. Hear me. Hear what's going on. Hear what's the cry of my heart. See what's going on inside of me. See what's happening inside of me. See it, God. You see it, God. Do you see it? Of course God sees it. We need to be a place where that's a, a cry of desperation. God, hear me when I cry. That's the place I had to be as a young person, and still even to this day. I have to come to a place where I'm saying, God, hear me. Hear me, God. Hear me. Because God hears us, but he wants us to learn to do what? He wants us to learn to be perseverant, doesn't he? Because what does persevering do? It builds character. And character builds hope, doesn't it? If you never had to persevere in anything, you wouldn't, ha you wouldn't have any strength at all. You wouldn't. If everything was given to you on a silver platter, I say, here it is, you wouldn't have to try for anything. But what does it do? Perseverance, when you press in and you really seek God and you're really desperate in your circumstances, in your situation, you're going to cry out to God no matter how long it takes. You're going to go and you're going to say, God, hear me. God, hear me. God, hear me. God, hear me. Even when your soul is in despair, even when your enemies are around you, even when your circumstances are dire, even when your situation seems impossible, even when all that's happening, you're going to still, even in the midst of it, you're going to cry out to what? To God. And what do you, you cry out to God for? It says, when I cry with my voice, so it's a crying, it's a pleading. And be gracious to me and answer me. In other words, they're seeking God's mercy. We're seeking God's mercy. How many of us need mercy? God's mercy. I know I do. I know we need his grace all the time. I'm a stinking sinner who needs his grace all the time. I do. And sometimes we have to ask for it. We have to ask for it all the time. Not that he doesn't want to give it, but he wants us to ask for it. Like a, like a child uh, asking his parents. And it goes on here and says, verse 8, When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. And then God gives us the instruction. God says, Seek my face. What does that mean, seeking his face? That means coming after him, pursuing him. When you really want something, how many of us, when we really want something, we're going to really pursue it hard, aren't we? We're going to really pursue it. Like, if we want a, a new car, we're going to really work hard to get the money to get that car or that house. We're going to do whatever we have to do in order to get what we want to get. And we'll work hard to do it, won't we? We do. But it says here, when you say, and, when God, when God, and when God says something, God says, seek my face. You're desperate? I'll say you seek my face. In other words, it's, it, the idea of seeking here is not just a one-time thing. It's an ongoing thing. It's an idea of the ongoing um, action, seeking his face, continuing to seek his face. He says, seek my face. 
and keep on seeking my face. Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. So God gives the instruction. Then how do we respond to God in that? We say, no, God, uh uh-uh. I really don't want you. Because God should be our ultimate desire. Not material things, not relationships, but our relationship with him should be our ultimate goal, our ultimate prize, our ultimate desire, our ultimate aspiration is to what? Is to seek him and to what? Know him. That's our, and God's saying, seek me. You're in desperate need, seek me. And then what should be our response here? Verse, verse 8 says, your, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. So our response should be what? Yes, God, I, I will seek your face. In other words, I will seek you. I will rely on you. I will depend on you. I will call out to you. You are my greatest desire. You are my greatest hope. You are my greatest aspiration. You are my greatest all that you are, Jesus. You are. And that's what I want more than anything else. So our heart should be responding back to God. Your face, O Lord, I shall seek. That's what we should be. Because not only in the desperate, not only in the desperate times and in difficult times, but all the time. Because the, 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 the times, the, the most things that you, whatever time that you put in most is, is, a time, is the things that you desire. To t- whatever time and, and, and passion you, you put into things, the most is the thing that you, pa- you have passion the most. And you, can, you may disagree with me on that, but the reality is that, that if you love the Lord and you're passionate about the Lord and you're seeking the Lord, not that you neglect other things, but your passion should be, I'm going to put more time in and seeking God and doing the things of the Lord and, and being passionate about him than other things. And that's a reality. Because we put hobbies, we put priorities, we put finances, we put material things, we put other things, people above God. We do. I'm sorry to say that, but we do. When Jesus gave our life, his life for us, the reality is he wants us to seek him above all things. What does he say? He says, seek ye first, what? The kingdom of God and do what? Matthew 5, 6. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. You put him first. Seek him first. Not just in desperate times, but all the time. That should be the desire and the passion of our hearts. Verse 9, it says, our plea. Do not turn your way, servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not abandon me or forsake me, O God of my salvation. So there is a plea here. God, do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. I mess up, God. I make mistakes, God. Don't cast me away. Don't cast me away, God. Don't turn me away, God. I messed up. I'm a sinner, I know. I'll be the first to admit it. Paul said, called himself what? The chief of what? Sinners. I messed up. God, don't turn away from me in anger. Please, God, don't turn away. I know I've, I've, I've screwed up here. I've done things that I ought not to have done, God, but please don't turn me away. Please show me mercy. Please show me grace. Please show me forgiveness. How many of us need the mercy of God? I do. I need it all the time. I need it all the time. We all do. And that should be part of our, 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 our cry and our plea to God. God, don't turn, me, don't turn me away in anger. Don't do it. Because God, that's not the kind of God that God is. Sometimes, you know, our earthly fathers were like that. Sometimes our earthly parents were like that. You know, we messed up one time, they, they shunned us, and it's, it's like... Go to your room, and then they want you to come out and do, and they don't want to have anything to do with you. Not that you don't get disciplined, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, is that you don't treat them in love. See, God treats us in love. And what Paul, I mean, what uh, David is saying here in this psalm, is say, God, don't turn me away in anger. Show me mercy. Show me mercy, God. Show me mercy. Show me mercy. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. We as parents are flawed. We have our mistakes. 
We have our idiosyncrasies. We have our problems. We have our issues. We do. We're not perfect people. Only Jesus was perfect. I don't think there was ever a perfect parent out there. Abraham wasn't a perfect parent. David, by no means, was a perfect father. Just read about his life. Samuel the prophet wasn't a, a, a perfect father. But a lot of throughout the Bible, you'll see people that weren't perfect parents. But the reality is, is that, and, and people will mess up. But, but it says here that the Lord will take me up. Who will never mess you up? Who will never forsake you? What the scripture says, I will never do what? I will never leave you, nor what? Forsake you. So even though our parents mess up, even though maybe our parents forsake us for a minute there, God will never. He loves John. He loves each one of us as a good father. As a good father, he loves us. So that's why we can ask him, even in our desperate times, even when we think that this is really hard, God, and I really can't do this anymore. And, it's really, and we sometimes lose our patience and we're, we're getting weary because it's taking a long time. Doesn't it happen to us sometimes? We're desperate and we're crying out to God and we're seeking God. And we're getting thinking, God, when is this ever going to get answered? God, you see the situation, you see the circumstances, you see what's going on here. God, my father, my, don't forsake me, God. My father and mother have forsaken me. People have forsaken me. People have turned against me. It's happened. I've had people close to me turn against me, folks. I've had it. Reality, people in the church have turned against me. You know, and so the reality is, is that it happened, but the Lord never will. Doesn't mean that those types of circumstances won't happen to us, but God never will. And that's what we have to keep reminding ourselves, and that's what David reminded himself of, is that God never will forsake us. My parents might, I mean, family members might, or close people might, but God never will. God never will. And don't let the enemy tell you otherwise. Don't listen to those crock of baloney lies that the enemy tries to tell you. Because God never will. Even when our circumstances don't even seem like it. Even when it's taken a long time. Thank God, this is taking a long time. God, God is taking so long. I don't know if I can make it, God. I don't know if I can make it. I've been in that circumstance and, and, and in certain prayers and certain situations and cer certain things in my life. Guys, I have. And I know then... Like, and in certain ways, I still am in prayers, waiting for God to answer. God, I'm desperate. And I know that you're going to, I know somehow, some way you're going to answer. I don't know how, but God, I don't see how, but I know that you are because you're not going to forsake me. Will you? you won't, folks. He won't, he won't, he won't. Don't listen to those lies. Do not listen to those lies. Don't listen to your own emotions. Because our emotions can get the best of us, can't they? They can. And our emotions will, will make decisions out of emotion rather than out of our trust and our faith in God. Don't let your make decisions. Don't make your choices. Don't make, let your things be just done on emotion in the moment. Because that's when you make mistakes. And that's when you make things that can be harmful or detrimental for you in your faith and in your life. Yes, we need emotions. Emotions are important in our lives. And it's really important. But, the re but don't make your choices and your decisions solely on emotion. But base it on your faith and your trust in the Lord. Let's go on here. David knew the Lord. And it says in verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path. So David knew that he had a relationship with his God, and that he was asking God to do what? To teach him his way. While he's waiting, while he's waiting, he's saying, God, teach me your way. Lead me in a level path. God, guide me. Direct me. Show me. Yeah, I don't understand the circumstance. I don't understand the situation. I don't know, God. 
But even in the midst of it, while I'm waiting, while I'm trusting, while I'm looking to you, while I'm calling out to you, while I'm pleading to you, God, teach me your way. Show me. Make me into the person you want me to be. I'm trying to persevere here, God. Show me what I need to do in order to change. Show me what direction I need to go. Lead me, guide me, direct me. So you're asking the shepherd to lead you. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what? Want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He, he leadeth me beside still waters. He restores what? My soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For your rod and your staff, they come from me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of what? The Lord forever. Of course, that's, we know that's the 23rd Psalm. But the reality is, is that David knew that even through the valley of the shadow of death, he was asking God, the shepherd, the good shepherd, to do what? To guide him. Through the valley. Even though it was taking long and the valley was long, and there was, and there was um, animals and creatures and, and, and enemies up in the hills coming down. You're asking God to guide you, to lead you, to direct you, and show you where to go and what to do. And we need to ask God to instruct us, because we don't know. We don't have all the answers. We like to think that we do, but we don't. Billy Graham didn't have all the answers. As great a man he was, in the Lord, in his faith, he didn't have all the answers. He was a flawed man. Apostle Paul was a flawed man. All the apostles were flawed uh, people. The great leaders of today that we have in the church are flawed people. And they, they will all be willing to admit that they need to ha ask for the instruction and the leading of God. As great as they are in their faith, and as great as they are um, with what God has given them, they still need the Lord's leading, and so do we. Well, let's go on here. Verse 12. Do not deliver me over to desire my adversary, adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me and such as breathe out violence. So the pleading is, God, don't deliver me over to my enemies. God, I know they're surrounding me. God, I'm in desperation right now. God, I need you. False witnesses have risen against me. How many of us, and I've been in this boat, how many of us have had people that have risen up against us and have told lies? Yeah. I've been there, folks. False lies. What, and so what's David saying? Do not deliver me over to my adversaries. Desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. Those who tell lies against me and against my character and against who I am as a person. And such as breathe out violence. What their whole purpose is, is to destroy me. That's what gossip does. Even though gossip may sound juicy and it may go, and sound good, what does it do? It destroys a person's what? Character. It destroys somebody's character. And that's why God hates, and the, the, the scripture says he hates gossip. Even though it may feel good, it destroys a person's character. And God hates anything that destroys another person, his creation. He does. And so, because it's lies, folks. It's lies. And folks, we need to um, know that, God, you've got to protect me from the lies. We can't participate in it, and we can't, but we also need God's protection in it, don't we? We really do. God, please protect me. God, please guard me. Because they're telling lies and they're telling untruths about me and my situation and who I am. Did that happen to David? Many a time. Especially with Saul and with his, with his children. But let's go on here. And verses 13 and 14, our hope and our instruction. I love this verse. This is like one of my favorite verses. Um, these last two verses are like one of my, a couple of my favorite verses in the Bible. Verses 13 and 14, it says, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. What kind of message is that? The message of hope, isn't it? Folks? I would have despaired. How many of us have been on the brink of despair? I have. I've, had, I've been on the brink of despair many times. 
on the brink, on the precipice, going down, and the cliff is right there of despair. And you're about to go over the edge. I would have despaired at what? Unless I what? Had believed what? In your heart. Unless I had believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I hate to say this, but a lot of folks take their own lives because they're in despair. Don't they? They don't have a hope. But that hope comes from where? Jesus, I would have despaired unless I had believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The hope is in who? It's in Jesus. In him. That's where our hope is. That's when we feel all, when we're feeling alone, we're feeling afraid, and we're feeling desperate, and we're feeling like we can't do anything, and we remind ourselves of that great hope. It says Jesus is the uh, is the anchor. It's a hope. He's the anchor, which is the anchor of our soul. The reality is that hope is what gives us the motivation and the impetus to move on and to go beyond and to wait and to trust the Lord, even when we don't see things coming, even though we don't see things happening, even though we don't see things like answers right away, and we don't give up and we don't give in and we don't capitulate and we don't fall apart. We trust him, we look to him, we put our hope in him, don't we, folks? I would have despaired unless I had believed I would see the goodness of the Lord. I talked about this a couple weeks ago, the goodness of God. God's a good God, isn't he? The good father. And we need to remind ourselves of that, folks. We need to remind ourselves, and that's our hope, because God operates out of a, of a heart of what? Goodness. He's just, that's absolutely true. And God will... And God will take, and God will always judge justly and rightly. And God will always show grace. But God's a good God as well. And God will, we need to remember that in our own lives. When we're in despair, when we're in desperation, when we're in fear, when we're, God, I don't know what to do. And, and, and an answer seemed long coming. And saying, God, I'm not going to despair. But I'm going to look to your goodness. I'm going to look to you because that's who you are as a person. Listen to this. This is what he tells us to do. This is not a popular word. It's, four, it's a four-letter word. It's not a popular word. W-A-I-T. Wait. We don't like that word. Especially in our culture today, do we? Mm -mm. We want our answers instantly. We have instant, we have instant news. We have instant, especially in our social media. We want the answer right now, and we can't have the answer. Sometimes we can't have the answer right now. Sometimes God gives us the answer right now, but sometimes He doesn't. And he tells us this horrible four-letter word. God uses four-letter words. Yes, He does. W A I T. And when we learn to wait, we learn to wait, we learn the act and the character of waiting and being patient, that does something for our character, doesn't it? It learns, because you don't, and then when you learn to wait, then you don't operate in the decision of making hasty decisions and choices, do you? I made hasty decisions and choices when I was, when I was in bad situations and dire situations, and I didn't wait. And I, and I paid the, I paid the consequences for that. But the reality is, is when we learn to wait, wait for the Lord, be strong, not just muscular strong, but strong in character. How many of us know, I keep asking this question, how many of us know, but the, but the reality is, is that people, you admire people who are strong, with strong in character. So, I do. I know I look at people who are strong in character. And that's what he's talking about here. Wait for the Lord. Lord. Be strong in character. In the person. Doing things right. Waiting upon God. Finding your strength in God. For when we are weak, what? He is what? 
strong. Because our strength comes from him. Wait and be strong. Even though we might be small in, in, in stature, we're strong in character. Mother Teresa was a great example of that. She was a small little woman. Small little woman, but she loved the Lord. But she was strong in character. Strong in character because she learned not only patience, but she learned to find her strength what? In the Lord. And the reality is, is that with us is that we find our strength where? In him. Even in the midst of the storms, even in the midst of the trials, even in the midst of the difficulties. Be strong, let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. I want to close with this scripture. And if you, if you turn with me, um, look at Isaiah chapter 41. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 41. And read along with me, starting at verse Isaiah 40, actually. Um, Starting at verse 28, listen to this. I'll read to the end of the chapter, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to the end. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, like we were just talking about, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain what? New strength. There it is, that waiting and getting strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not go, they will run and not go tired. They will walk and not become weary. So our hope is in the Lord, and when our hope comes in the Lord and hope is in him he'll do what he'll give us the strength that we need as we wait upon him and we'll be able to come we'll be able to see the victory we'll be able to see the answer we'll be able to see what God has done and uh, and there's one other verse the Lord was reminding me of and it's the verse that Kevin sends me every day or Bible verses every day and one of the verses for today and Nicholas had up here today is Jeremiah 29 it says, um, for I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future. And a hope. That's God's plan. God's plan is to give us a hope, a future and a hope. And he's going to pull us through, folks. He's going to give us the strength that we need. He's going to give us all that we need to, to press on, to persevere, and to get through. That's our God, folks. And he's going to do it. Trust him. Don't give in. Trust him. Press on. Build those spiritual muscles. Be strong in character. Wait on him. Amen?